Good evening. Yeah. Power. What is the psalm that is most renowned for adulation for the word of God? Boom. So verse 99 of that psalm says, I have more insight than all my teachers. How did that happen? For your testimonies are my meditation. Yeah? Verse 148 of that psalm, My eyes anticipate the night watches. Why? That I may meditate on your word. So tonight is all about meditation. I don't know, I think I'm becoming dangerous technologically. I'm becoming dangerous. Not quite chat GPT, okay? Not quite AI, but I figured out how to take a screenshot and just take a picture of it and crop it and put it into some other thing. So now you don't have to type all that. You, you just take a picture, send an email to yourself, copy it, paste it, cut it a little bit, just take the, boom, here you go. I love this. You're not going to rain on my parade, Randy. I am really excited. The last few days I've been cutting and pasting like this for clients, for you know different applications. Maybe. Uh, so the Bible uses meditation as, as deep contemplation, a turning over and around in the mind to gain greater understanding and be changed by God's truth. What is the Hebrew meaning of meditation? So um, the word meditation is translated in Greek. There you go. And its derivation in Hebrew means murmur, muse, mutter, sigh, whisper, moan, dull sound, and a bowing down. I think I've heard you teach about this like a decade or two ago about what meditation means. I remember one of your classes, probably the teacher's class, that it, the, the, the original word has the idea of, and my, my youngest daughter would be mortified, but she's not here, and she doesn't watch YouTube. Um, but when she was really little, she would eat some foods, certain foods, I don't think it was all foods, but certain foods, and she would keep it in her mouth, and she would just keep processing it. We called it, she called it chewing the cut. For cows, we call it chewing the cud, but she couldn't say that, so it was like chewing the cut. But, I mean, her sisters got good at um, recognizing this. We'd be sitting at the dinner table, you know, and one of them would turn and say, Lydia, are you, are you chewing the cut? She's like, yeah. And she's got some bite in her mouth for five minutes, and it's like, oh, that's gross. But that's the idea of meditation. It's you take a passage, you take um, a verse, a scripture, uh, some words of God, and you just mull it over, and you repeat it to yourself, and you turn it over and around, and you just chew on it, right? That's the idea. So that's what tonight is about, because we took a lot of time to cover the text, right? And I advertised from the beginning that, to the, from before the beginning, to the, to the brothers who are going to teach, I emphasized, I don't this class to be just about covering the text, covering the facts, covering the history, covering the story of these people's lives, rehearsing the stories. Where do, you, where do you know the stories? I want a good bit of the time that we spend. What does this mean? How should this change who we are? How should this change how we think, how we talk, how we act, right? Application. 
Um, and so tonight is devoted to that. Um, you all remember the passage in 1 Corinthians. It's in the context of the um, spiritual gifts. The Corinthians had some problems with spiritual gifts, right? What were some of the problems they had? Yeah, and they, didn't, they weren't right about what the best gift was, by the way. In, in Paul's estimation, it was more like knowledge or prophesying, but they thought tongues was like all that. Um, if you can speak in a different language that you didn't study, that's really cool. I agree. But even better, if you can help someone understand uh, God's, God's teaching, God's word. Oh, they were, um, you know, infighting, they were uh, jealousies, they were comp com competition, all that kind of stuff. So he gave some teachings, some practical teachings about how to use their gifts. And in one of those passages, he says, each one of you has a word, a song, right? Let it be done for mutual edification, right? It's not competition. It's to share together, to bring something to the table that will help someone else in the room or several someone else's in the room uh, to be edified, to be encouraged, right? So that's, that's what tonight is about. So we talked a little bit about Spectacular, what I'm calling, this is just, these are just my words, spectacular versus pedestrian faith. We looked at several examples, you know, Naaman dipped in water, that's pretty pedestrian, any of us can do that. We've all done that once, right? We let somebody dip us, submerge us into water. Um, was it Adam? Or was I in Tampa? I think it was in Tampa, I think it was Frederick Gray, that I heard a, a take on baptism that I don't remember ever hearing before. But he made the point that what is one of the worst ways to die? Drowning. There's fire, there's, there's, there's a lot of bad ways to die. But one of the worst ways to die is drowning. And so isn't it remarkable that God asks us, commands us, as our entrance into the kingdom, as our, he, he expects us to imitate, to reenact the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, his son. And the way we do that is we helplessly relax and let another human being take control of us and dunk us under the water. Now, depending on who's doing the baptizing and depending on who's being baptized, isn't it possible that if this some guy just got a crazy idea, he just held you under? Could kill you? It's, tr it's, it's very possible. And you're just making yourself vulnerable, giving up your life. Now, I don't think any of us really process that. Like, what are the odds that this guy's going to hold me under? But I, I thought it was an interesting point that that is the act that God calls us to. But still, it's a, it's a pedestrian act. It's a simple act. You just give yourself up and let yourself be dunked underwater. Versus spectacular, like Abraham and Noah and Moses. We talked about that a good while. Both are honored in Hebrews chapter 11. We talked about the, um, and I should change this to conscripted versus volunteered. That would be more parallel, more, more consistent. Conscripted versus volunteered. So, uh, Abraham was conscripted. He was told, do this. Noah was conscripted. Moses was conscripted. And then you got people like Jonathan and David with the, with the Goliath and the, uh, and the bereft mothers um, who volunteered, right? So lots of powerful examples of faith of different sorts. And... Um, We've noted that a lot of the episodes that are cited deal with death. Either uh, the cause of the death in some cases, or um, even if it's natural death, as the person is nearing their natural death, what are they doing? What are they saying? Right? And so it is, I don't think I am concocting this 
I don't think I'm imagining this, that a theme of death in connection to these episodes of faith. And so when we look at um, the three patriarchs, the three first patriarchs, uh, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, I didn't notice this until last week, but uh, there's, a, there's a little story about Abraham believing the promise unto death. It's, it, it pales in significance compared to the big things that he was asked to do. But late in his life, as he knows he's getting near his death, he adjures, he, he conjoins his servant under oath to take, uh, to go to his home country, to among his relatives, to find a wife for his son, Isaac, the son of promise. He makes him swear, put, put, his, put your hand under my uh, thigh, right? And take an oath. Um, and there's some discussion about that. But whatever you do, you don't take my son out of this land. Why? This is the land of the promise. He's promised it to us, to my descendants, and I don't want him leaving the land. So Abraham has an episode like that. Isaac has an episode like that. Jacob has an episode, multiple episodes like that at the, at the end of um, Genesis. Okay? Joseph as well, but we're not going to talk about that. Right, Keith? Keith's going to talk about that Sunday. All right, so... Let's get to the application. What does application mean? What does application mean? What do, what do we mean by that? Let's apply this to our life. What do we mean by that? And what does that mean? Useful. I'm not saying that's a bad answer. I just make it more... Um, okay, and what does that mean? It's not been long ago that one of my children was doing algebra, where you get this complicated, complicated, uh, what's the expression? Uh, equation, you know, it's like letters and and cubed and squared and pluses and minuses and divided all these functions is like this long expression, mathematical expression. And what does the math publisher want them to do? Solve it or reduce it. Reduce it to its like lowest common denominator, right? You just prove that you can work your way around this these numbers. You know your, your math functions, right? So that's what I'm asking us to do for a minute before we get into the uh, application of these. Is like, what does application mean? What does it look like if you applied the faith of Abraham in your life? How would you know? How would you know that you applied it? Okay. Okay. So I think uh, Mr. Larry is touching on a thought that probably comes to all of our minds is that when we think about Abraham and what he was conscripted to do, <laughs> that we're like, Oh, very intimidated, very daunted. Um, I would compare it, how many of you had had this thought about the, when you, when you read the story of the rich young ruler? How many of you have had this thought? I hope that God never asked me to do that. How many of you have ever had that thought? Honestly, anybody willing to admit that? Oh yeah, like, I, you know, part of me is like, man, I'm so glad he hasn't asked me to do that. I hope he doesn't ask me to do that. What would I do if he did? Right? Now with Abraham, it's, 
it's kind of really hard, really intimidating, and kind of really easy at the same time, right? Because how many of us believe that God will ever ask you to take your most beloved person on, on the planet, your spouse, child, and you ever wake up and want possible thing. I'd never worry about that. Not in that form, right? Part about Abraham is those are big things. That would I be of that caliber? If asked? The easy part is, yeah, I won't be asked. I, I don't really have to struggle with that, or wrestle with not going to get that. The other, what? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Sure. So I like what he did there. He took verbs and he just took them as stated. He ignored the context that we know is true of those um, obeyed and called and he went. And we just ignore that and just say, well, okay, what am I told to do? And am I obeying what I know? Am I, am I doing what I know I'm supposed to be doing? Number two, am I ever being called or sent anywhere to do anything? And if so, am I doing it? So, other, other, before I um, weigh in, other other thoughts about what do, how do we know if we're applying? How can we tell that we're applying it? Yes, sir. Mm-hmm. Okay. So I think um, how I would answer that question is it comes down to how I think, how I talk, and how I act. So if I look at my trend, if I look at my track record, if I look at a week of my life, 168 hours of my life, and I, th and I examine, how do I, how do I think? What are my waking hours? What am I thinking about? How do I think about them? What is my attitude about whatever I'm thinking about? All of that. Um, imagine that you're having a, uh, an echo, right? An echocardiogram, 168 hours of echo. What we're going to be able to do with that is we're going to be able to draw some trend lines. Yeah? Okay? We do the same thing with my words. What do I choose to talk about? The content. Uh, the words that I choose. How could we describe the word? Are they, are they um, positive? Are they reverent? Encouraging? Edifying? Are they... Bitter, harsh, negative, discouraging, right? 
168 hours. I'm sleeping some of the time. I'm quiet some of the time, believe it or not. And so the words that I use, I got a trend line. How would, how would you objectively characterize my words? And then you got my actions. I think it's true now as much or more than ever in human history that most Americans get to choose how they spend a high percentage of the hours of their week. What I mean by that is if you go 100 years, 200 years, and more, the mass of population were born into a situation and it was very difficult to change significantly your situation. I mean, if you were, I mean, something like 95% of people had to be engaged in agriculture, farming, producing your clothes, producing your food, producing your housing. That's what you had to do because the technology, the, the, the uh, production possibilities, the industrial revolution had not happened. And so you just had to spend pretty much all your waking hours producing the stuff you need to live. So guess what? 90% of people were farmers. A uh, certain percentage of people made clothes. A certain percentage of people made lumber. And, and that's what you did. And if your if you're that, that's what you did. And if your grandfather did that, that's what you did. And you did that for most of your waking hours. That was it. And it was pretty hard to bust out of that. You with me? And now we happen to be born in 1940-something or 1950-something or 60-something. And here we are. And wow, it's just way different. And we, our society is set up where for the first 20, about 20 years, you can just learn. What? I mean, there's, there's not been many years in human history where you could devote the first 20 years of your life to just learning. You had to be productive. At 6 and 8 and 12, you had to be out earning your keep. First of all, you know, you, you birth 6 kids, 8 kids, 12 kids, only half of them or so are going to make it to adulthood, so we got to be productive. So, again, you, you might think, well, i got to sleep and i got to work and all that, but, but a lot more choice now, our world, maybe not in Africa, maybe not in parts of Asia, parts of South America, but in America, 168 hours a week, you get to choose how to spend a lot of those hours. And so, um, if we looked at a trend line of how I choose to spend, discretionary choice about how I spend my time, that would be a good place to start, wouldn't it? And it's not just do I choose to do evil things or not do evil things. What is the nature of the stuff I choose to spend time on? How much time do I spend on that? How much do I, time do I spend on other things? Right? So that's what I think it comes down to. And if, if I spend time chewing on, meditating on God's Word, I let it affect me. I let it um, consume me. I let it uh, permeate me. I let it work on my heart. I mull it over and I ask questions. If I look at my week and then my next week and my next week and my next week and nothing changes... There's no measurable change. How convincing would I be to you if I said, I've applied the faith of Abraham. I've applied the faith of Isaac. How convinced are you? Anybody convinced? To be convinced, you'd have to think, well, you, you applied it a long time ago, and you just keep applying it. But how many of us think that that's where I am? Is that I am a master level, a master level practitioner 
of the faith of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And so that's why as the weeks pass and the months pass and the years pass, there's not significant appreciable material change in my thoughts, words, actions over time because I've already, I'm already there at a high level. Reactions to what I've just said. Okay, it's a good question. You didn't think I would, um, to quote a movie, another movie, please tell me you have a plan. Please tell me your defense for these two men that are, their lives are on the line is not that you were hoping that I'd admit in the or that I ordered the code red, right? So obviously I don't, I'm, I'm not planning to just ask questions. I hope to be helpful. Yeah, I think I see, I can't tell. Uh, I think I see some pensive, thoughtful looks on the faces. I can't tell who's close to wanting to say something. So I'll give a little more time. Yes, sir. Sure. It wasn't clear from my rhetorical uh, this or that. Uh, my point was that I don't think you would be convinced if you looked at my week after week after week, month after month after month, and you examined how Steve thinks, how Steve talks, and how Steve behaves over a substantial period of time, and you didn't see big changes, you probably wouldn't say, oh, he's already mastered. He's at a master class level of faith application. You'd probably say, he's not applying it. He's not applying it on a, on a continual basis because I don't see anything changing. Because application, we all know this, application is not just you sit and think about it for a minute and you, you move on. It's like, James, what does James say? He's got a great, simple illustration for this. There are two types of people in this world, to quote another movie. To quote another movie, there's two types of people in the world. People with shovels, people with guns, People who did. Yeah? Two types of people in the world. There's people who look into the mirror, the perfect word, and they see their reflection and they say, I need to change. I need to change this. I need to change that. I need to change this other thing. And they set out to do that. And then there's other people who look at it and say, oh, that's interesting. Yeah, okay. And then they turn away and they've forgotten what they're supposed to be doing. And so application has to somewhere come down to you see some changes in how I think, how I talk, how I act. And if you examine a fair, objective body of work of your thoughts, words, and actions, week at a time, month at a time, and you look at that over time, and you don't see significant changes, that's a problem. You're not gonna, you're gonna have a hard time convincing your brothers and sisters, your family members, let alone Jesus Christ, that you are applying. Yes. Correct. Or even, even very many times in your whole life maybe, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. 
So I, I like how she set that up there. Could everybody hear that? No? Okay. So um, the Abrahamic Noah Moses moments where you're conscripted to do something grand, they don't happen very often. And so how do you prepare for them when they, if and when they do happen? She said, well, you've got a, you've got a um, what's the word you used? Purpose, purpose in your heart. You know, like, like uh, Daniel, purpose in his heart. I'm not going to eat the king's dainies. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to follow the Mosaic law about, about dietary restrictions. So you purpose in your heart. You, you think about it. You plan how you're going to do it. Right? It's kind of like it's kind of like the idea of you know how do you act in emergency? Why do we do fire drills in schools? Because if we didn't, there'd be zero chance, zero chance that when there's a real fire, the kids are going to do what they're supposed to do, and they're going to a lot of them are going to get killed. Now, when there's a real fire, there's still a pretty good chance that not everybody's going to do what they're supposed to do, and that's why people get killed in fires. The doors chained from the outside or inside, they can't get out. Alarms don't work. All kinds of nonsense, right? And we vow, you know, the, the, the news stories always say, what can we do to make sure this never happens again? The answer, nothing. There's nothing you can do to make sure this never happens again. It's going to happen again. It's hu it, we're human beings. We make mistakes. But the reason we do fire drills is so we've got a fighting chance, a decent chance, that when there's a fire, the kids will be practiced enough that they will go into the mode of, I've prepared for this, I, I remember what I'm supposed to do, and I just act. Right? And so I think that's kind of the point she's making, is that if we think about it, commit to it, purpose, then we are, are likely to do that. But one of my questions about that is, and I'm sure we've all engaged in these mental exercises, is if I needed to give up my life for uh, my wife in a heroic, chivalrous moment, you know, would I do it? Number one answer now, when I was 27, 28, I'm like, yeah, yeah, because that's the thing I was supposed to say. Now, I'm like, I hope so. Much more humble answer, I hope so. But, I, but another thing I, I, uh, that occurs to me is that if you, the best way to know whether you're going to do something in a, in a stressful moment, in a... Um, you know, burst of glory is to just look at how you're behaving on a daily basis. Okay? There's not too many people, there's not too many people who heroically give their lives, their lives in a moment of, of stress who are not already people who are sacrificial and considerate and helping people. Okay? It is, it's just not the way it works. Selfish, wicked, evil people don't suddenly, in a moment, just throw their life in front of someone else and, and, and save them. They tend to be people who are already that way, right? Uh, generosity is another one. If, if, if God came to me and said, I want, you to, I want you to sell your house, I want you to give away your retirement accounts, I want you to clean your bank account out, and I want you to give it all away, and I want you to just come and do itinerant preaching, and I'll provide you what you need, the food you need for today, and the clothes that you need for today. And we'll, I'll just day by day, you'll just go, and we'll for you. Would I would I answer that call? Would I do that? I think the best way to know is not sit and wonder about it. Not sit and wonder about it. It's say, okay, what am I doing with the stuff the Lord's giving me now? Am I being generous with it? If the answer is no, then hmm, I'm, I don't think I'm going to be very convincing to say that if called upon to do this really hard thing, I'm going to, I'm going to answer the call. All right, Joy, put your hand up. Yes, that's, that's one way to look at it, yes. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Yes, I think that's that's a good um, a good angle to look at it. 
certainly a biblical angle. Yes, sir. Right. Yeah. Which is pretty big. <laughs> Didn't start out easy. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. Yep. <clears throat> so when you look at it, I, and I separated them this way because I think the Abraham uh, episodes are the intimidating, dramatic, uh, heroic things. And Isaac and Jacob, the things that are mentioned in Hebrews 11 are a different character, a different quality, right? Um, so, you know, how, how do we apply Abraham's faith, the, the, the heroic kind? You know, you ask yourself, am I willing to pick up and move? Um, so along the theme that I've been just recently saying is, am I willing to be inconvenienced now in small ways? How willing am I to be inconvenienced for the kingdom's sake on a daily basis? And if I'm honest with myself and I look at my track record and I, and I don't like what I see, then I, I'm, I'm fooling myself if I think, yeah, if, if called upon to do some big heroic thing like pick up and move, I think I would do it. Well, you're not doing very small things when they're inconvenient to you when they cause you to detour from what you want to do, what you've planned to do, and you see a need, you see something that would cause you to say, hey, I'm sorry, I'm not going to be there. I'm going to have to cancel this appointment because there's somebody who needs something right now. I'm busy with my work. I'm busy with some important thing that I need to do. So daughter, son, friend, neighbor, I don't have time. I'm sorry. I'm busy. If that's consistently your trend, I think the answer is probably no. Probably no. Am I willing to wander from place to place having no roots, no property ownership if, if you're called upon to do that? It's really not that hard. If you want to take a half hour or an hour to just sit and mull over your attitude about your stuff. It's really not that hard to come to an honest appraisal, an objective appraisal about your relationship with your stuff. If I'm a grasper, clinger, it's too important to me, I, I love this example. I love this example. That it's, is how do you, your brand new car, or a, cl a new clothes, or a new tie, or you know, some money into it. You you think it's beautiful. You care. You worked hard for it. You care about it, and then something happens. Your, your daughter backs out of the garage and she scrapes the, the, the back of the Mazda 626 on the, on the retaining wall the day you came home from the dealership with it. How do you react? Right? And so on. We, we all have these stories, right? We all have, you know, whether it's something relatively small, it could be my, my daughter, I pick her up at Chick-fil-A, She's got her uh, iPhone. The battery died. So what does she do? I mean, what would you do? If the battery's dead and it's on your wrist, what would you do? Well, what she did, she took it off, put it in her purse. And her purse is open. So when it's time to leave, she picks up her purse, she walks outside, and somehow the 
the iPhone laying on the top inside the purse, open purse, unzipped. She kind of bounces or something. Something happens and the, the iPhone bounces out of her purse, falls the wrong face down on the concrete, and it cracked. It's just like all, you know, you know what charred, gla charred glass looks like. Okay? Well, pretty calm. Gets in the car and she just shows it to me. She's disappointed, but within, you know, a minute, I think she was moving on. I, I don't know what, inside what she was doing. Uh, we're in Tampa and um, moving Miriam, moving her stuff. Of course, you, you, you call on the man child, right? Man child, strong, uh, helps move, right? And uh, somehow he drops his, I don't know, what does a Google phone cost? A million dollars? Ten thousand dollars? I don't know what it costs. But bad luck, he drops it face down. I mean, if it landed on the edge, on the end, I mean, there's all kinds of ways this could have happened in the grass, but no, it lands just the wrong way on a asphalt thing, and it's just like obliterated. It's like, ah, oh, I think it cost him 300 bucks to get the glass, to get the screen replaced. So he was in a funk, I don't know, a few minutes, I mean, I don't know, half hour. He didn't, he didn't sin, he didn't like curse, he didn't treat anybody badly. I think he did pretty well, he moved on. So, I mean, those are, those are the kind of things that you can, I mean, how will I act if that happened? Well, just ask yourself, how do you act when the little, you know, smaller things happen in your life? How tied are you to your stuff? Am I willing to sacrifice my son, my child, my most important relationship? So we know we're not going to be asked. There's one time in human history that we know of where God asked a father to sacrifice his son. So we're not going to be asked to do that. But Jesus says that anybody who loves father or mother or son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. I came... Uh, you know, of course, he came to bring peace, but in another sentence, I came not to bring peace, but a sword. I came to separate families because that's going to be the consequence of truth and loyalty to Jesus Christ. It's going to cause certain people to not accept it, and they're going to draw the lines, and you're going to have to decide, right? So are we willing to do that? Are we willing to stand with Jesus, even if that means, um, you know, giving up a relationship, separating uh, disappointing somebody, making the relationship awkward, uh, following teachings in Scripture that I'm going to follow to make sure I'm aligning with Jesus and sending you a clear message that I do not approve and condone of your, of your behavior. Are we willing to do that? Isaac's and uh, Jacob's faith. I think there, there's, you know, what does it come down to is, is, they believed the promise. That's the point of the Hebrews chapter 11 episodes, is that they believed the promise because right up when they were about to die, how did they behave? They went out of their way to bless somebody, one of their children, because the promise was important to them. They believed it. They were convinced of it. We, we belabored the point about uh, Isaac and e Jacob and Esau that there was much moaning and bewailing because I wanted this promise to go to you because it really matters and what I just said is going to happen and it's going to be a big deal and I meant it for to go to you and it, I got tricked into this other son. Made a big deal about that. He believed the promise. Joseph gave uh, orders about his bones. So did Jacob. Take my body. So did Isaac. They believe the promise. And so the question, I think this is an easier one probably to wrap our hands around, arms around, is do I believe the promise? Now, their promise was the land. There were other promises too, but the one that's focused on in their behavior is the land. I want my bones here. I want, I want to be buried in the cave of Machpelah. I want you to pick a daughter, a, a, a wife for my son, and I don't want him leaving. Don't take him out of the land. It's a land promise. What's our promise? There's lots of promises, but what, what do you latch on to? Okay, it's the crown of life. 
It's uh, if then we have died with Christ and we're seated in the heavenly places with him, then set your mind on things above, right? It's uh, Jesus' promise that uh, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. And so do I believe the promise? Powerful, powerful observation. You know, they're talking about food and washing hands and washing dishes, but in that context, Jesus teaches it's not what comes, what, what goes into a man that defiles him, makes him unclean. It's what comes out of his heart. That's who he is. And so words come out of your mouth because they first are in your mind. Actions first are in your heart. And so, you know, how we, how we um, talk, of course how we act, but just how we talk is a big deal because it comes from what we're thinking. It comes from what's on our mind. So a few um, things I want to share with you. Uh, I heard about this a decade or more ago, maybe two decades ago, but I heard about this family that they would talk to one another when they, when they parted, you know, at holidays or... Um, they had a thing. It was a family thing. We're going to meet at the North Gate. I may have the direction wrong, okay? It may have been the East Gate. I don't know. But the point is, a mom and a dad, at some point in this multi-generation family, thought about the promise of heaven and said, you know what? Let's make this tangible in this one little way, this seemingly little way, but we're going to make this very real and tangible. We are going to talk like we believe it in this one little way, and we're going to tell our kids, as much as it's within us, if God allows us to do this, maybe, maybe the 12 uh, apostles will say, no, 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 you can't go to the north gate. You're, you're already assigned at the south gate. Okay, okay, no problem. Okay, we're not going to argue about it, but the point is we're imagining, we're thinking about heaven, and we're imagining arriving there. And we, wanna, we, wanna, we, wanna, we want our family to be there. And so we're trying to imagine what that's going to be like. Really imagine it. And so let's agree that we're going to meet at the north gate. That's going to be our gate. So they, they agreed on that. And then they remind each other about that. Now, do you know what I thought about that when I first heard it? Anybody want to admit what you thought about it? Like it? I haven't done it. So what does that tell you I thought about it? I, I admire it. I'm impressed by it. But I kind of thought that, like, that's a little... It's a little silly, isn't it? That's a little quaint. I don't know. Is that, that's nice. It's like, they're there. That's what we do to the six-year-old. They're there. That's nice. So here's what I've, I've thought about this. It's not a rash vow. I'm not being Jephthah here. But I've thought about this, and I, I, agree, I decided I was going to commit to you all. So I'm, I'm committed now that I'm going to have this conversation with my family. And we're going to talk about it, and we're going to come up with our version of that, and then we're going to remind each other. I think that makes a difference. I think things like that make a difference. Just like the Hebrew writer evidently thinks that it matters that Abraham made his servant put his hand under his thigh and swear an oath that you're not going to take my son out of this land. That Jacob said, you must take my body back and bury it in the cave of Machpelah because that's where I need to be. That matters. I got a text from a friend. These are just kind of things, you know, recently I've been thinking about these things more because of this lesson, this application. And I got a, a, friend, a, a text from a, a friend 
who said, hey, I, was, I gave an invitation and I based it on a conversation I had with him you know, 12, 15 years ago where I, I kind of scolded him a little bit. I was correcting him. He's a younger guy. And I said, hey, it's, it's, basically I was quoting uh, Peter, it's all going to burn. It's all going to burn. Now, I'll leave this last rhetorical question with you. How many times does your brain go to Scripture, like something that's happening, a conversation you're having, and your mind goes to Scripture, but you don't say it out loud? And why? Why? Are you embarrassed? Am I embarrassed? Is this person not a Christian, so we don't want to mention it? Do we not want to make a big deal? Do we not want to be thought of as a spiritual freak? I leave that question with you. I am determined to more and more often, if my mind goes to Scripture, I'm going to say it out loud. Okay? All right. That's all we got time for. They're wanting to get in.